with great pleasure that we have this event tonight with this publication of this lovely book, Queering Contemporary Asian American Art. And, <laughs> and it's with appreciation that I'm going to introduce tonight those who are part of the creation of this volume, including Laura Kina and Chris, um, Jan Christian Barnaby. And both of these wonderful folks who are here tonight from Chicago um, were part of the 2012 NEH Summer Institute uh, here at APA Institute at NYU um, titled Reenvisioning American Art, Asian American Art Research and Teaching that I was able to co-direct with the scholar Margo Machida. During their time at the Institute, they were a part of a self-organized project group of scholars and curators who wanted to engage about the intersection between Asian American art and queer studies. And the editors and authors in this volume note that um, the late and much beloved scholar Karen Higa, who was at the Institute, had mentioned how so many of those of us who are involved in the field of Asian American art and visual cultures are not straight art historians, but that there are these approaches from us that come therefore from all different directions and offer a very unique perspectives into the building of the field and the fact that it still remains outside of formal disciplinary structures in the academy. In this volume, uh, this liminal space of absence mirrors the idea of querying and querying Asian American art. I believe that was actually the name of the group, um, uh, querying and querying Asian American art. Um, do, uh, in relation to the dominant normal, normative approaches to art history and visual studies, the prominence given to the visual, it queers and questions the academy, the field and beyond into the everyday. Queering is seen as an opening generative verb, one that enables spaces of messiness, uncontainability. It's uncategorizable, unsimplified, intimate, at times unshowable and unknowable, and haunting, and in its own respect, very much the everyday real that exists within the practices and the identifiers and influences and contextualization of, contextualizations of these artists that we will talk about tonight. Um, we will hear about their work and how they play with constructed realities of temporality, the archive virtual space, and the imagined possible futures. We'll hear more about this tonight in relation to shifting identities, diasporic practice, and interventions that are the space of Asian American art. I'd like to introduce the two editors of the volume who have come to New York for tonight's event. Um, Laura Kina is a formidable artist and scholar an LGBTQ ally whose paintings address Asian American and mixed race identities and histories um, with a focus on Okinawa and Hawaii diaspora. She's exhibited at the Chicago Cultural Center, India International Center, Japanese American National Museum, Okinawa Prefectural Art Museum, and the Wing Luke Museum, among other spaces. And she's the Vincent DePaul Professor of Art, Media, and Design, and Director of Critical Ethnic Studies at DePaul University. She um, has also co-edited War Baby, Love Child, Mixed Race Asian American Art. And she co-founded the Critical Mixed Studies Conference in Association and is the reviews editor for the Asian Diasporic Visual Culture and the Americas Journal, which is um, based here at NYU with APA Institute as well as in Concordia in Montreal. And Jan, um, Jan is the operations, new media and curatorial director of the Center for Art and Thought, a nonprofit online hub that fosters Philippinex and Asian diasporic arts and ideas through digital curation and literacy programs. And he is coming out with a book on contemporary Philippinex American photography and video, the politics of archives and queer critiques of US empire. And um, he also serves as a member of the community advisory group for equality, Illinois. Um, please welcome both Laura Kina and Jan Christian Barnaby. Thank you. Um, we do have a, a couple of thank yous before we um, actually start. Um, the, the, the show here. Um, we'd like to thank Alex and Alex, Alexandra Chang and uh, Marga Machida for that wonderful 2012 Summer Institute where uh, Laura and I met and um, where basically the seeds of this book project came together. Um, 
We wanted to thank the APA Institute and the Center for Art and Thought for um, sponsoring the, the book um, for publication. And, um, and there are a lot of people, artists and scholars who we invited for this, this book project that we would also like to thank. I mean, it was a five-year uh, labor of love kind of project, and uh, we couldn't have done it without um, all of these really fantastic artists and scholars who agreed to take time out of their busy schedules and lives to, uh, to talk to us um, about their work and um, to allow us to um, show their work and, and publish their work in, in the book. Um, we also would like to, this is just sort of a plug to our, uh, our, our publisher, the University of Washington Press, who, um, really uh, gave us a lot of freedom to explore all of these really interesting ideas um, that are found in the book. And um, so for any sort of would-be scholars out there, the University of Washington Press is a really um, amazing group of people to work with, um, just FYI. Um, <laughs> so as Alex said, um, I'm one of the co-editors co of the book. I'm a Philippine ex um, American gender queer queer Gen Xer, so that's a couple of generations I think um, above you guys. <laughs> uh, for those of you starting uh, NYU or you know continuing on, um, I'm a little older than you all. <laughs> I am. Uh, I work for the Center for Art and Thought as the operations, new media, and curatorial director, and I highly recommend. Um, you checking it out. We have uh, a show on, uh, a virtual show on there uh, that is affiliated with this book called Queer Horizons. And um, uh, if you Google Center for Art and Thought, you'll see, um, you'll see the link to, to the organization. Um, and a lot of the artists who participated in the book um, are also featured in Queer Horizons. Um, uh, let's see, I am, I consider myself an alt, alt, alt academic as well. I have a PhD from the program in American culture, um, but I work in nonprofit and I, uh, but I still sort of write for academic journals as well, so I don't quite know how to describe myself. I'm kind of an academic, kind of not. Um, and um, I've also written for other uh, outlets on all things, um, on new media and, and whatnot, and um, mostly about art and all things queer. So if you want to look for other things that I've written, just Google my name and things might pop up, um, <laughs> good or bad. <laughs> um, and uh, I have a new book coming out as well. Um, probably next fall or early um, the following spring on uh, contemporary Filipinx photography and video art and the politics of the archives and queer critiques of US empire, also from the University of Washington Press. So shout out to them again. Um, I am also on the advisory board, community advisory board for Equality Illinois, um, hoping to get folks and um, people in Chicago and statewide to be more civically engaged about LGBTQ policies, um, sp specifically on immigration rights, racial and economic social justice, and policies that are inclusive and affirming of transgender and gender nonconforming um, communities. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Laura. We're going to do this shuffle. <laughs> we, we wrote a script together so we'd stay on point. And we have matching li uh, lip gloss today. So, yeah. Anyway, um, my name is Laura Kina. We thought uh, we would start by talking about our positionality. Um, I go by she, her, hers. I'm an artist and academic based in Chicago, as Alex said. Um, my scholarship is focused on Asian American contemporary art and also critical mixed race studies. And as a studio artist, in my practice as a painter, I've traced my family history as migrants from Okinawa to Hawaii um, to work as sugarcane plantation workers at the turn of the last century. So I've been interested in non-normativity and racialized otherness or racial failure for some time, but with this project, querying contemporary 
contemporary Asian American art. Um, our book is situated within women of color feminism and queer of color critique. So I'm working from the position as an LGBTQ ally to continue to explore both Asian American and mixed race identity, uh, but through a focus on gender and sexuality. Um, so as we mentioned, we met at NEH, at NEH Summer Institute here in 2012. Um, so the seeds of this book were planted during that time. Um, it was there that we met many of the scholars represented in the book and where we had the opportunity to learn from the lead curator and late curator and scholar Karen Higa, who we dedicated our book to. Um, in one of her lectures, um, she had offered a picture of what we as scholars, writers and artists and curators were capable of, of doing to the discipline of art history. And she called us termites, the termites of art history. Um, and as we saw our work in the field of art history as a whole, eating away at the foundations of art history. Um, and uh, we were, for example, learning about disruptive and productive methodologies to write about Asian American art that was helping to establish it as a, both a legitimate field of study, but also to broaden the discipline of art history to be more inclusive of Asian American art. So each of the participants in our summer institute um, brought their own interests to the lectures, and we began unofficially forming interest groups after classes in our lectures, sometimes late into the night, right? Uh, going out to dinner and drinks. Um, and one group formed based on their interest in Southeast Asian arts, another group focused on pedagogy, um, another group, which is the one that would bring us together to work on this project, was called Queering and Querying Asian American Art. Um, so this querying group uh, was interested in how queer of color critique, queer theory, and queer frameworks could inform and offer alternative ways to write about or curate Asian American art. Um, when we started the project five years ago, um, we were basically interested in the intersections of Asian American art, queer bodies, and sexualities. And I don't think we realized how relevant this work would be at this moment in time as we face the current assault on LGBTQ rights and LGBTQ erasure, erasure by our current administration. And also in light of 45's proposal to shut down the National Endowment of the Arts and Humanities. Um, so this book project stands on the shoulders of many scholars and curators who have paved the way before us. We mentioned uh, Margot Machida, Alexandra Chang, Suzette Min, Sarita C, Mark Johnson, and Gordon Chang, and the late Karen Higa and many others. And so we hope our book can serve as a meaningful resource for those interested in the productive intersections of Asian American art and queer of color critique. Okay. Um... We also hope that uh, the academic chapters and artists' interviews and the artwork can inspire more interest in um, this really fantastic field of contemporary Asian American art history and criticism, and also um, inspire political engagement um, that's grounded in intersectionality and relationality. Um, we also have this sort of secret desire to convert um, our readers into um, termites themselves. Um, so in whatever you choose to pursue, whether that's art or you know whatnot, um, really think about sort of institutional change and how that can um, be brought about by your own sort of interests um, and, and scholarly pursuits or creative pursuits for that matter. Um, so given also the, the current state of our country, we definitely need more termites to eat away at um, the constraints being placed on uh, LGBTQ people, people of color, immigrants, refugee and asylum seekers, you know, and the list pretty much goes on and on and on. Every day there's something new um, that comes out. Um, so hopefully, we, you know, we hope that this book can be a source um, of inspiration for all of you. Um, the book is composed, I mean, as you have sort of seen in the background, um, is, uh, there's a sort of ongoing slideshow of the scholarly chapters and, so, and the featured artists that we um, have in the book. And so there's seven scholarly chapters with a forward um, by Suzette Min and an afterward uh, by Q Lee, who's here, and we'll talk after our presentation, after we're off the stage. Um, all but two of the scholars um, 
uh, Howard Suarez, who's a professor at Oberlin College, and Valerie So, who's at San Francisco State University, who are not part of the NEH um, Summer Institute, but um, they are a part of our book. Um, the anthology is organized thematically um, in thematic sections that queer or queries a particular uh, topic, such as surveillance, time, affect, methodology, subjectivity, mixed raceness, and Asian America. Um, we are we are indebted to uh, the work of Jack Halberstam and especially. Um, uh, the Theory of Queer Failure, which we write about in the introduction of, of the anthology, and as well as um, Jose Esteban Munoz's uh, Theory of Futurity and his rebuttal of Lee Edelman's anti-relational thesis in Cruising Utopia. It's a really interesting book, and in, which I recommend if you haven't already uh, looked at it. Um, that is to say, um, this anthology takes on a relation, so we use Munoz and we take on a relational positioning by welcoming identificatory markers of difference within Asia America that constitutes for us what we call the queer uh, Asian American horizon. So I'm gonna introduce the panelists. Uh, Keeley is our first presenter, our resident philosopher, um, and is gonna start us out thinking about the nature of queerness, and we hope our speakers will consider the questions um, she raises during the round table that we'll, we'll moderate. Um, and you're also gonna have an opportunity, to, we'll leave time for a Q&A for all of you to ask questions, so be thinking about that. Um, so. I'll go ahead and briefly introduce all the speakers and then invite Q up. Um, you have a program, right? Yes? So their complete uh, bios are in the program. I'm just going to briefly say a few things. Um, Q Lee is a professor of philosophy at John Jay College, CUNY. Um, she is the author of Reading Descartes, uh, Otherwise Blind, Mad, Dreamy, and Bad in 2012, and the co-editor of Women's Studies Quarterly Issue on Safe um, in 2011, and Critical Philosophy of Race Issue on Xenophobia and Racism from 2014. Trained nomadically in European philosophy and literary theory, she works widely in interwoven fields of arts and the humanities while traveling across disciplinary and spatial-temporal boundaries. And sitting next to Q is Grayson Hong, uh, who's originally from Chicago and, and now based in New Haven, Connecticut, where she teaches video at the Education Center for the Arts, Gateway Community College, and the University of Bridgeport. Um, she's a new media and performance artist whose work explores memory, loss, per personal histories, narrative form, displacement, and the body. Hung's work pulls from the personal experiences to contemplate the choreographies of space, trained bodies, and the way we use nonverbal language to communicate via sound, light, and gesture. And her recent works attempt to imagine impossible realities of the queer gendered bodies. And then we have Saya Wolfolk, who's a New York-based artist who uses science fiction and fantasy to reimagine the world in multiple dimensions. And with multi-year projects like No Place, The Empathics, and Chimatech, um, Wolfolk has created the world of the Empathics, a fictional race of women who are able to alter their genetic makeup and fuse with plants. With each body of work, Wolfolk continues to build the narrative of these women's lives and questions the utopian of, uh, possibilities of cultural hybridity. And finally, we'll have a presentation by Zave Martajano. Um, Zave is an interdisciplinary artist interested in geopolitics, social justice, queer glam, and embodied healing. They were born in Canada and called New York City and, and Indonesia home. Uh, Marta Harjano is currently a dance artist in residence at the Bronx Museum of the Arts through the BXMA CoLab residency. So I wanna welcome all of you. Hello everybody. Um, great, well thank you for being here and being contemporary. <laughs> This is uh, um, so. I have um, so many people to thank, but I'm going to um, just uh, uh, do that later in person, in the interest of time. Also, because we have a, uh, this uh, schedule uh, to follow, and I have about ten minutes to deliver something <laughs> from my point of view. And as somebody who wrote the afterword huh, to this book, uh, and I um, also had an opportunity to think about this book as a whole uh, at this point, and it was interesting to go back and, and, 
uh, browse through this uh, p uh, beautifully uh, curated, I must say, book. And this, um, uh, I, I like that Niagara <laughs> in the cover. Okay, so um, as I just have about, again, now it's going to be nine minutes, right? Um, uh, I decided just to kind of show some pictures. Uh, I thought picture book approach might be the best way to do this. So um, the um, showing some pictures and some some words that accompany you know the, those uh, stream of images that I also see, uh, both uh, in the book and and elsewhere. And I titled my sort of introductory intervention or reframing huh, or, or entry into this uh, in terms of what I call queer envisioning. So queer vision, and we have a queer envisioning, queer as, as, as an act, as we also heard at the beginning of the introduction, right? This sort of a query or questioning, this part. And I sort of am also in the process of trying to write a book, uh, kind of queer book on, on philosophy. I'm a philosopher by training, among other weird things. And so this is um, part of my interest in, in thinking philosophically and queerly about philosophy and, and queerness itself, and so alternative aesthetics is the kind of concept that I'm interested in exploring. I'm not going to talk about it that much, but just as a pointer, right? So we talk about alternative, but also what does it mean for us to think about alternative, right? Uh, as a way to, to, to question the, the, the sort of the domains of essentialism, uh, which has been uh, critically criticized uh, by this whole queer paradigm. Um, so, uh, and by the way, Jen, I just dropped your middle name because I wanted to get the space right. <laughs> it's an aesthetic decision, <laughs> okay? So, if I just were to summarize from the beginning what I want to say, um, I want to really just to show uh, certain um, traces of, of queerness not only in historical sense, but sort of conceptual sense, uh, the kind of um, a certain uh, aesthetic and conceptual registers of this concept. So uh, at first we have this notion of fragility, right? This sort of unrepresentable, right? This margins that, that and the oddity and strangeness, which is a kind of etymological sense. So from uh, fragility, then we have uh, in the 1980s and you know 90s that the notion of fluidity, right? How the gender, for instance, sexuality, you know, this becomes a site not of uh, a certain uh, external determination or, or codification, but somehow how that itself generates some fluid kind of critical force. And so gender trouble can be read from that point of view too, for instance. So that I take to be some part of our common knowledge of what you know, the trajectory of a queer concept is, but I'm going to look through that very quickly. I mean, you'll, you'll see it, but I'm moving from this notion of fragility and, 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 and fluidity uh, to the notion of fungibility, right? This is the kind of the crisis point that we see in queer studies, right? Uh, one thing that you can also think about is, I remember this uh, line from New York Times, I suppose it was, well, in this neoliberal capitalist society where anything that's considered to be odd or, or transgressive or strange or, or, or on the margin is immediately swallowed into the market logic, right? So that there's a kind of queerness becomes a kind of marker of certain um, outside aesthetics that becomes fashionable, right? So fungibility here is like anything can be queer or anybody can be queer. So you can imagine a certain puzzle if we're living in a world where everything and everybody is and can be queer, what is queer or who is queer, right? And so there's a, a question of, is a queer saturation, right? Uh, what kind of critical force does a queerness actually have today in this uh, transnational, global, and also, um, uh, uh, well, neoliberal, I mean, I just use it as a keyword, uh, um, um, planetary kind of you know, regime. And so this is where I want to move. I mean, I think our book, 
if I can say it, really just uh, intervenes into that uh, the, 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 the terrain of this sort of identity politics and post-identity politics. So how do we move from fungibility question to fugitivity, right? So we, you, you escape this question of, or, or the kind of force, of active force of this determination, but then from fugitivity, then we have this notion of futurity, which is also what uh, 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 Jen also mentioned briefly in reference to Jose Munoz's uh, uh, scholarship, right? Where queerness is considered in a more temporal uh, sense. So that kind of what you'll see later, queerness is about, say, the ability to reimagine a new future, right? So a certain um, past archive, right? How does that re-arise how does it re-arise, right, in the domain of this uh, new imaginary? And so futurity becomes a key paradigm that we see. So there is a kind of banking on future, queer future, or future as queer. But then I want to push that further in saying what comes after future in, in an age where future itself seems to be disappearing. <laughs> and so uh, I realize that there are so many F words here, so my apologies. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, f from this, what, what kind of F? Huh? What, what is the other F? That's what I'm still thinking about, but I want to move in that direction. So I already said what I want to say, so I'll just show you some pictures. So my afterword here. So just a really quick, like a 10 second sort of uh, rundown. So what is queer? Huh? I was charged the task of talking about what queerness is and was and will be and will have been. And so I just wanted to give you a quick, so this is like, you know, very kind of, uh, you know, the odd sort of like early modern sense of oddity queerness. And you see that in 19th century Victorian and early 20th century kind of, you know, literature where it is sort of uh, uh, the sexualized connotations of, of queer. Uh, uh, um, uh, arises quite predominantly, and this notion of uh, of transgression, right? Uh, and it's, it's, uh, I, I mean, I've looked at some of the uh, definitions and, and kind of queer definitions, uh, not quite, but still, this is a, uh, I think a, a fairly concise, good introduction to to that. Okay, so here, as you can see. Uh, queer is, is both uh, a description of a state, right, an adjective, but at the same time it, it, it is a verb, it's an act, right? to queer something. So this hence the title of my, my uh, afterword, to be queer being, to queer it. It's not a sentence. Hmm? It's still hypothetical. Hmm? It's still conjectural, right? And so, uh, if this is what we have been uh, dwelling on, and, and I just want to point to, can you read that? A little bit, right? So I just, uh, uh, again, I told you that I'm just going to picture, so I'm cheating. This is a text, but I'm taking a photo of that. <laughs> and so what I want to just kind of show you is the kind of the focus, right? The, the, the question of, I, I, I thought this particular paragraph is, is beautifully capturing hmm? what we want to do. It's a relational positioning hmm, of querying, right? So Asian American APA as I mean as a given category, but how do we relationally repositioning it in relation to right other categories? So this is a great way to to think about queer uh, as a kind of uh, critical lens. And again, I'm not going to read a whole uh, a paragraph, but you can just uh, remember that. Uh, so again, this is a picture. <laughs> I just took a photo of this. It, it, I realized it looks like a, some fancy restaurant menu, right? <laughs> so, or if we use a termite a metaphor, you know, we can you can look at it like um, like a two pages. Uh, and I'm going to cite Elizabeth Bishop a beautiful line uh, from this uh, poem. Uh, uh, it's, it's, I mean, I see it as either a restaurant menu, like a very sleek kind of menu, or, uh, quote, like two pages of a book uh, uh, that read each other in the dark, right? And I, I was quite, um, I, when I was reading that, that, that line from a poetry, I mean, it was kind of, it resonated with, with this particular image that I just came up with, because it's, it's the idea of, you know, every, every part is about queer, right? And a beautiful also uh, the subtitle for the love of unicorns. Right, this is the, the introduction, the subtitle, and then this is the theme that also you mentioned, right? And so here, the the interesting thing about this uh, curation is that these keywords are in communication, 
with one another in these pages. So these are simply a kind of sort of mobile index. You can follow that from any point of view. Right? There's something really beautiful about this uh, curation again, which is a little different from very linear philosophical work. You see why I'm really interested in also this kind of uh, composition. So as I said, I'm interested in particularly entering in this, into this terrain or, or zone through the, the question of surveillance or, or you know, I say kind of counter surveillance or surveillance as we also we talk about in this book as a queer envisioning. Uh, this observatory tower, right? So you have the eyeballs all going along, right? So we're in your gadget, it's all. So we are living in this world of surveillance. Right? So from macro and micro, you have all these sort of gadgets and, and that sort of, and this is, this is a, a, a page also for, from the book, uh, Jill Maggot, right? Um, and Saya's work <laughs> here. Um, just want to show the sort of how the question of seeing, right, the vision and envisioning or counter envisioning is 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 central to the kind of the critical or aesthetical practice um, in APA uh, context. And this is, I say again, you see that like uh, Eli's uh, work on on. You know what it is? It's a toilet, right? A toilet. And it's good security and comfort, toilet and 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 and, and a selfie, right? <laughs> at the same time. So you know it lo almost looks like there's a camera uh, lens. So if you put this together, you have a really interesting uh, mosaic of this sort of proliferation of queer gazes, right? Uh, avoid eye contact, watch, uh, see. So this is a. And this is kind of what I do when I walk around in New York. <laughs> it's, just, it's interesting, avoid eye contact. And so what, 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 are, what are you looking at? What do you see? And this is you know, what I'm doing, I think. Therefore, I sit <laughs> at a toilet. OK, stop, think, observe, proceed. So as you can see, we have a, a, this images of, 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 of uh, intersectionality, but also kind of transience, right? Things are moving along, and then you, you, you pause at a moment where uh, something comes into contact into, in, into your, um, uh, I mean, with your own perceptual schema, right? And this is what I like, I mean, there's a new material that I want to a bit sort of experiment with a little bit. Um, this is um, kind of this is from chemistry, right? So the, on the one on the left is a cis isomer, right? And the the one on the right is a trans isomer, right? And so this is a kind of a interesting. I mean, because of this now reframing of the question of of, of a sexual, right, identity, like right? and then the biological makeup. Uh, what I find interesting is a twisting of this um, the the bond, right. Uh, in the trans uh, uh, metaphor, and just as an image again. And so this is a part that I think is um, really also central to uh, uh, the project. Like, uh, how do we rethink the notion of fugitivity, right? And, and, and Jan's question, right? The question is, wait a minute, it's not just a self or toilet, right? How do, we, how do we rethink the surveillance in terms of surveillance, right? The intervening into the very field of, uh, of, 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 of look, looking and, and, and inspection. And I'm just giving you some pointers, again, about the, um, the, the Asian American f queer futurity, uh, for time and space does not shun the past, but rather renders it a source of inspiration, right? Uh, and what interests me and what kind of puzzles me and still keeps me uh, engaged is the question of what is that a new futurity? It's not just a futurity or the future, not just a future, but new future. What is that newness? How, where and how, uh, how, how do we locate it? And, uh, and so given that we have this categorical immobility, right? Everybody is somehow boxed into this identity. It's like bubbles and all these sort of choices and options. You can you can you can you know proliferate yourself in all sorts of ways. And so the this dialectic of mobility and immobility is at the heart of the queer aesthetics of politics. And the corner is the chamber of being. This is a citation from Gaston Bachelard, uh, the Poetics of Space. Uh, so what do you see? What is your vision? or our vision. Uh, 
and I'm just going to go out through the door. <laughs> this is a little, <laughs> a little door <laughs> that I gave myself to. So thank you very much for your attention. So I wanted to thank everyone first, of course. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity to be here and to share my work with you and to be included in the book. Um, uh, the work that is included in the book is called the Funereal Archive, and um, not surprisingly, it's part of the subjectivity chapter. Um, and it came from um, an arts publication where I actually had to use a PDF format. And um, at the time, my grandfather had ju just passed, my mother's father. And I had gone to his funeral and started to sort of face these very specific things that come with grief, um, family, uh, immigration specifically. Um, and then of course, uh, gender, which here is this grandfather that I have um, who I never really got to experience him fully because of language barrier. Uh, and he never really got to know me very well because of the, the gender issue. Um, and so I, I really started to think about what is the shape of my grief? And the PDF form allowed for this kind of continuous scroll. Um, and so what I included in here are elements like trying to translate the program that was written in Korean using free translators, which only made things more incoherent. Um, trying to, and then what's funny is I also found myself essentializing my own identity. Um, like I discovered that the Korean national anthem was to the, to the sound of Auld Lang Syne. Um, and so that's included in here. Um, I looked into like popular music, the time he was born. Um, so trying to find something as the way that grief often operates um, that from somebody who's absent um, and could I connect with him in this way and, would I, could, and what could I connect with given that of his absence and the fact that there is always going to be this distance as a result of borders and nationalism. And at the very end, I also realized like we both served in our military and he served in the Korean War. I served in the US Navy, it never really made that connection that he and I are the only two people who really served in the military and sort of end with this kind of cheeky note of the fact that I know how to fold the American flag. Um, and it's sort of an act of masculinity, which the link comes from the art of manliness. Um, and of course, he left Korea as a war, result of the war and I left the Navy as after 9-11. Um, and so the PDF form some, somehow really worked for me. I was really responding to it. This sort of like weightless, bureaucratic, eight and a half by 11, like it's designed to be shareable, right? It's compatible with any format. Um, so something about it really resonated. And it, of course it works really well with archiving and archive being a collection of data. And I thought a lot about just how is the archive a collection of data, and could and the data is supposed to tell us something about us, right? Where we're from, who we are, and if we were to look through it all, it would reveal something, hopefully. Um, but what defines things that go in an archive, and could I use an archive in order to even find my own sense of subjectivity? Um, and so this work came out of a year-long residency that just went up last a couple weeks ago, at the beginning of this month, and it's called Your Only Limit Is You. Um, and it's an installation that sort of had to figure out how could I bring the sort of PDF form or the digital flatness into an installation. Um, and so if you were to walk around the space, um, you'd see uh, intentionally flattened images and of objects, um, screenshots, there's some video. And of course my background is in performance and so I bring back the body as well and the body is present in, in, in many parts of this as well as especially the center. Um, and after the election, which my residency ran through, you know, began right before, um, I really found myself facing my limits. This moment of, I think, I imagine a lot of you were like, what it, could I have done more? What, what could I possibly even do? And, and that being sort of a moment of re-recognizing my limits. And that also being an opportunity to recognize that that was shame. Essentially, I was experiencing shame. And a shame for something that I don't really know what my connection to is. Um, but there was this deep shame as a result of the election. And so I set off on trying to find my limits, but in this sort of convoluted way. And I began with measurement, specifically the fathom. And here I sent my partner a text message. Uh, a unit of measurement for the depth of water is a fathom. One fathom is 182.88 centimeters within the range of Dunbar's principle for social limits. Fathom derives from the fathom, which meant the length of a pair of outstretched arms, which is approximately six feet, but also a big hug. A fathom is also the depth we bury our dead. And so, of course, we also know the figurative form of a fathom, which is to be, uh, to understand something. Um, <clears throat> and so I 
constructed this box that actually is built to my wingspan. And so if the wingspan is a fathom and my fathom essentially measures five feet six inches, which is a lot bigger than I expected because I'm only 5'2", but um, uh, and so <laughs> that was a nice moment of knowing my reach is a lot bigger than I expected, but, um, but it is six inches shy of a fathom. And so that went into the work as well. And so it became this series of different things that I'm trying to kind of measure. And this is a, a limit graph, for those of you who are studying math, um, a limit graph, or remember, um, of, of um, a limit function approaching one as limit approaches infinity. Uh, and then, of course, we have this issue of if the subjectivity is, is if my subjectivity, or, or I am one, I'm a singular body. Um, and so the limit graph is an example of a sort of approaching one. In which case, though, this is expectation and pressure to always go beyond the one, right? And so we have this Nike ad, which is where the title of the work comes from, um, from a motiva motivational quote that has an unknown origins. Um, but you can see here with that sort of very like sans serif modern design and typography. Uh, but then I started thinking about what, so what goes beyond the one? And so if we are social, then our social network becomes the expansion or the connection or going beyond that limit. Um, and so I came across Dunbar's number, which uh, he's an anthropologist who just, through studying apes and social behavior, um, has this theory that based on the size of our brains, we can determine the size of our social networks. And so for humans, it would be actually 150. Um, and so I thought, well, who, who are the 150 people I know? And this is where I start to collect the data. Um, and this became an opportunity to start to actually include the people in my life that expand my limits. And so in the installation, you'll see my family, my partner, uh, the works of my friends as avatars, as a connection, as a part of the work. Um, and this sort of continuation of the pseudo information. I mean, this is how many times I Googled protest since January. Uh, this is the, uh, how many times I've changed my pronoun. I, after the election, I actually went back to she, her pronouns. Um, measuring my masculinity, whatever that means. Uh, and all of this data, there's, there's so many elements that I was kind of just sort of like collecting, like could it tell me something? Um, but it needed some kind of context. And so I ended on the, the end note or the footnote or an annotation. And that being this sort of like marginal space of information that I've always been really interested in. I think academ as academics, I'm sure you under, uh, know what that's like. And it's this weird nonlinear space that belongs and is important but is not the center. Um, and so I ended up utilizing the, the end note form. Um, and so there's three pages of end notes that link to every item in the room. And here you'll find more data, biographical information, the distance I must travel to meet my family or hang out with them, um, the amount of money it costs to do certain things in the show, things I should have been reading but I didn't watch TV instead, for instance. Um, so the shame part becomes this crucial part of when I think about my limits and the limits being the ends of my reach and that being an opportunity for the unknown and failure and then of course shame. Is that a baby? They need a fake smile. That is not our baby. That is. You have to use it though because these are these shitty websites. Oh my god. No, you have to do the screenshot of the whole thing. Like this is a whole experience. Look at this horrible cake. You know what I mean? Like this is what this whole thing. This whole thing. Like look at this horrible thing. <laughs> Yeah, perfect. Like that's what needs to happen. <laughs> that's so terrifying, and it doesn't make me feel special at all. <laughs> Cue your gadget just reappeared. Yeah. Um, so this is a video I made with my partner um, called Baby Maker, and it's also in the installation. And um, as you can see, it's a free software that allows you to see what your baby might look like. Um, and this be being this sort of like an endlessly curious thing that my partner and I uh, wonder about, this sort of impossible reality of ha you know, what, having our like, DNA. I, I don't know why, right? We have, this, we have this desire to know wh how cute our baby would be if we could actually physically, and maybe science will catch up one day, um, be able to do that. Uh, and this became the project, and the, this drawing is the Venn diagram of our genetic material. 
Um, and so, it, you know, if you think about it, it ends here. And so I think about looking back. Um, and so this is a series I made up. So it turns out there's no regendering photograph services out there. And so, um, and I'm not interested in any kind of revisionist history. I just like was curious, like what would I look, have looked like as a boy? Um, and so I went to Costco and they have a photo repair service and they took two tries. And what I had wanted was of course, what I intended was to get the result on the end, but what I got was this unexpected middle and that became the most interesting thing to me, is the original, and then there's the expected results, and then there's this in-between space that we are always thinking about and talking about in terms of queerness. Um, but the fact that that middle space doesn't fit anywhere, there's no place that it belongs, it doesn't exist, um, and yet Costco could do it for me, which is nice. <laughs> um, but, and so that led to sort of more work about embracing and going back to the fathom, and the fathom being an opportunity to think about what can fit in my embrace. And so here is a series of hugging photos where I look around the world to find things that'll fit my embrace. Um, and out of curiosity, I wanted to know what that fit would look like. And so this is a plaster um, cast of my, the shape of my uh, embrace, um, and that being my fathomable space. And so you can see here, this is the horizontality, the nonlinear surfaces, and trying to see that sort of digital possibilities in a fixed space. Thank you. I'm Saya Wolfalk. Um, Thanks for coming out tonight, and uh, I'm so excited to be in this book. It's so amazing. I get to give it away to all my students. Okay, so talking about families. Um, so I uh, thought I'd start by showing a couple of family photographs that I found uh, in my maternal grandmother's home when I was in Japan recently for my cousin's wedding. Um, the image on the left is my um, great-grandmother and my grandfather as a baby and his siblings. And the image on the right is my grandfather and my grandmother getting married. And this is in Japan, my, my family's, um, my maternal family is from Japan. Um, this photograph, uh, taken a fair, uh, I guess it's taken in the 70s, uh, taken a while later, is a picture of my family here in the United States. Um, this is my mother uh, wearing kind of full kimono, um, my father and my grandfather, my paternal uh, grandfather and my paternal grandmother. Um, my paternal grandfather was African American and my um, Paternal grandmother was born in the Czech Republic, but was raised in um, Father Divine's uh, youth ministry in Harlem, New York. So basically was raised in a very intercultural African-American context in a kind of utopian community in Harlem. So with that kind of um, changing family history and story, um, when I started making work, I wanted to start thinking about uh, basically building a new culture. So I kind of started by working collaboratively with an anthropologist um, who actually went to the anthro program here at NYU. Uh, her name's Rachel Lears. And she and I started building a mixed race utopian world in the future where people are part plant and part human, change gender and color, and we created an ethnographic film, a 30-minute ethnographic film about this kind of culture, this future culture. So the first step was to create a Noplacian anatomy. We then started building installations and inviting people to talk to us about their ideas of utopia. So in these installations, people would kind of um, define their ideas of utopia, talk to us about their dreams and desires. Uh, and from the kind of ethnographic material that we gleaned, we scripted the ethnographic film. Uh, this is a video still from the chapter Self and Landscape, which is about the reproduction of the people of no place. These are the people of no place exchanging symbolic language with their ancestors and using uh, our recycled materials as usable technology. 
This installation has traveled a fair amount um, in the United States, Asia, and in Canada, and is presented kind of like a tableau vivant um, with the ethnographic film in the center. After working on uh, No Place for about two years, I started working with dancers and uh, started imagining how people of the present could actually become these future plant humans. And through a series of dance collaborations um, and also collaborations with biologists at Tufts University, I came to a story about these people called the empathics. So the empathics lend their material culture to museums and institutions around the United States. And they tell their story in a series of didactics and dioramas that display the material culture of these people. So this is the first diorama that you would see. And it's called empathic morphology, herniated consciousness because the first physical manifestation of becoming an empathic is to have two heads. Once an empathic goes through something called utopia conjuring therapy, they create visionary paintings. And so here you see an image of one of their visionary paintings that fuses disparate genetic information and cultural information into a book called Empathetic Plant Alchemy. Once that fusion is complete, they shed their second heads and develop petal-covered wings and attempt to enact the things that they see in their visions. This is a reconstruction of their Institute of Empathy in Greene County, New York, as well as hides and sheds that they molt after utopia conjuring therapy, and then they embellish and sell to perpetuate the research of their Institute of Empathy. As a part of the exhibition, there are a number of reenactments of empathic culture in the exhibition displays. And here's an example of such a presentation. So after I worked on the empathics for a number of years uh, and their institute of empathy, I began to think what would happen if the utopian desires of their institute, of their research institute, were co-opted um, and turned into a corporation. So I began to work on a project called Chymatech. Again, I returned to um, my kind of primary um, collaborative method for thinking through uh, this material. And I collaborated with a group of dancers at the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco to create something called a chimera in dance. I then scripted a video called Life Products by Chymatech. And the Life Products by Chymatech is a self-transformation line that allows you to wipe your identity clean, uh, download a new identity algorithm, and become your self-selected utopian possibility. This is a user using the avatar download station and a Chymatech operator facilitating her transformation. This is an installation called Virtual Chimeric Space, um, presented at the Brooklyn Museum and is now in the permanent collection of the Seattle Art Museum. Um, I'm currently working uh, with a technology company, kind of major technology company, to produce a, a virtual reality experience for the Chimatech Corporation um, so that anybody can experience the life products by Climatech line through YouTube on the internet. So the Chima Cloud, which is kind of the foundation of the Empathics Imaginary and Chimatech's Imaginary was presented in Times Square. Uh, so all of the videos, the kind of repository of the dreams and desires of Chimatech were presented on the Jumbotron monitors in Times Square. Simultaneously, I collaborated with dancers who were Chimatech operators to make present elements from the cloud, from the Chima cloud, at the transit center in Fulton Center. The dancers had iPads, and people could actually download uh, an application called Refract, an augmented reality application, and see a crystal, a virtual crystal. And the virtual crystal 
was the basis for all of the choreography of the dancers. You can see here my most recent installation of the work. Um, this is one of the cloud catching garments, a cloud catching station, and a series of fragments from the cloud. Thanks. Yeah, thank you so much for including my work in this book um, and for inviting me to speak a little bit about some of my work. Um, I'll talk about um, a theater piece that was written about in the book and then um, I'll talk a little bit about a more recent piece that I, that I did this, um, this spring. Um, and I just have photos, uh, photos from different works and I'll just sort of page through them as I talk a little bit. Um, so I am a queer, transgender, mixed race, Indonesian American uh, person who makes performance work um, primarily and I grew up mostly in the West, um, mostly in New York City via different histories of dislocation um, and emigration. Um, and uh, my Asian-ness and my Indonesian-ness is seldom legible. Um, and uh, my gender queerness adds to that. Um, and uh, a lot of my work reflects a kind of liminal, an exploration of liminal um, a rejection of boundaries. Um, and uh, also, I think a lot about assimilation, but I also think about, um, you know, particular kind, a particular avenue of cultural investigation and appropriation when one is disconnected from their ancestral culture and then has to reinvestigate it from both an outsider and an intimate insider lens um, and the complications of all of that, which is both a lived experience and um, has become my artistic practice. So I think about my practice as intercultural and transcultural. Um, and I think about it as queer, not just because I'm queer or because the topics might be queer or because my approach is queer, um, but thinking about boundary and border crossing as queer. Um, and um, my aesthetics uh, are often improvisation based, so in my movement work, um, I don't subscribe to an idea of choreography as a set of movements. I don't, I kind of follow in line with a lot of traditions um, uh, like uh, the post-war um, uh, Japanese uh, performance practice that is sort of now called Butoh and has a certain set of aesthetics now, but um, you know, as it began, it was a, a really groundbreaking kind of performance that rejected Western dance and rejected ballet and also rejected a kind of um, uh, the choreographic modern uh, Western form of dance. Um, <clears throat> and so I think a lot about these non-Western lineages and improvisation practices. And um, also I think about ritual. Um, and uh, I, I think about my work as dance, but I also reject. Uh, I'm not formally trained, and I've never worked with dancers who expect me to be trained, uh, choreographers who expect me to be trained, and so I follow that, those lineages. Um, and in a lot of my work, I sort of do this cultural intermix. So I'll take from, for example, um, Javanese Wayang mythology and puppetry in theater or Balinese dance vocabulary or um, impro non-Western improvisation practices and then also Western somatic practices and it kind of all blends it together. Um, and so the work that, um, that was talked about in, um, in Laura and Jan's book is called Brother Lovers. And uh, it's a theater work from 2014. Um, 
It essentially reconfigures the story of a very well-known um, ancient text called the Mahabharata, which has traveled through different parts of Asia and then landed in Indonesia and informs much of um, much of uh, both South Asian and specifically Indonesian um, storytelling. Um, this is this massive multi-volume um, ancient Sanskrit text. And um, I grew up with the stories from the Mahabharata in my childhood because all the stories that you hear about are sections from, from this ancient text. Um, and so I um, was reading translations of the Mahabharata for some time. And I uh, started to write a piece in which um, I took two archetypes, these sort of enemy half-brothers, um, who are Arjuna and Karna. And in the traditional mythology, they have these oppositional, this oppositional relationship. They, there's this unexplained conflict that um, shapes their, their relationship through thousands and thousands of pages and thousands and thousands of years. And they're, they're warriors each. Um, and one sort of represents, um, essentially, a sort of good and evil positioned against one another. Um, and um, I started to think about what would happen if in a sort of magical realist imagining um, they met at a disco club and accidentally fell in love. Um, and so the piece really weaves together both the mythology and my imagination of this kind of um, incestuous and very um, productive relationship for them to work out this unexplained conflict that's in the Mahabharata. Um, and I cast it with um, a, a queer and uh, gender queer cast. And basically, there are two um, sets of act actors who play the couple interchangeably. And um, it's not really explained necessarily, but um, I, I do some mask making and that sort of indicates who is who. Um, but they are these kind of two interchangeable sets of, um, of queers. And the storyline weaves them together where you sort of see these vignettes um, of the two couples and you understand this larger context of both the mythology. And then um, I also weaved in together with that um, uh, I sort of take it out of the story itself in certain moments and um, do uh, sort of think about my own autobiography and bring up questions um, that are not necessarily related to the story itself, but just related to my relationship to Indonesia and my relationship to queerness and transness. Um, so yeah, so I explored um, a kind of political conflict that these two archetypes um, are characterized by. Um, they are at conflict in this huge battle over a piece of land. And it has everything to do with um, a, a family that's essentially been split up. And one half of the family has been exiled. And there's this sort of warring, warring two parts of this family. Um, and I explore this sort of political conflict and exile and all of these kinds of themes through queer intimacy. Um, and yeah, this is a scene where I'm, I was blonde at the time, <laughs> where I'm talking to, a, to my best friend on stage and, we're, and he's talking about going um, home to India and experiencing his, his gender presentation there. And we're talking about sort of different modes of masculinity, different modes of, um, of sort of gender understanding in different contexts outside of the US and outside of the West, um, and how complicated it is um, on, on either side. Um, and then in this last scene, um, <clears throat> I so this last, this last scene of this theater piece is sort of about the ultimate um, trap of assimilation, essentially, in in the in the mythology itself, um, one of the brothers, Karna, who's the bad guy, uh, he has this ultimate. Um, he thinks he's going to win the battle in the end. This battle is going on for 
as I said, like hundreds of years over many generations. Um, and he thinks he's going to win the battle, um, but he gets tricked. And he has to rip off his skin, which is this golden skin, which uh, is his, which keeps him immortal. And it's kind of the only thing he's got in the world because he's an orphan. Um, so I have um, one of the Karnas in the play kind of do this buto dance in which she is ripping off her golden skin. And there's sort of uh, dialogue going on um, where I'm on stage talking about the traps of assimilation, how you never really get to win, even if you fully pass, even if you fully um, uh, are read in a certain way. There's always this, um, always this way in which you lose. Um, and I don't have a ton of time to talk about this, but I just wanted to talk briefly about this recent piece that I made. Um, uh, it's called General Dynamics. It's a dance piece more so than a theater piece. It's very chaotic, very colorful. And again, I'm, I keep on coming back to this um, understanding of the disco club, literally the 1970s disco club, as a space for invisible um, resistance um, and underground um, political um, self-determination in times of complete political disarray. So um, I have been I had been working on this piece, General Dynamics, for some time and um, had to uh, further develop it and show it um, this past April and thinking about, I had been working on it for a couple of years and thinking about how do I even um, make work post-election. I, I started to think about New York City in the 1970s um, when you know there was this incredible financial crisis, the the city budget, um, they were the city budget was in total debt, um, and uh, you know buildings were burning. It was just a really difficult time uh, for the city. And um, in the midst of all of that, there there were these uh, underground spaces, literally abandoned buildings, where people were coming together, black and brown, queer and trans, and straight folks coming together, and that was how disco was born. Um, so thinking about that juxtaposition and um, trying to approximate a possibility of resilience now in 2017 by thinking about past um, past uh, moments of of invisible and underground resilience uh, more so than I would say um, you know the quote unquote capital R resistance um, and so I was working with manifestos. Um, we had sort of these chaotic club scenes. Um, it's a very disorienting piece. There's a lot of, uh, there's multiple soundscape going on. It's, uh, it's, it's actually pretty jarring to watch and it's not a comfortable experience for, um, for the audience. Um, and uh, yeah, and I, and I continue to think about um, sort of all of this border crossing uh, ways of mucking things up aesthetically and um, and also conceptually um, and uh, also continuing to use mythology in a way sometimes just referencing back to past histories as a way of keeping um, an understanding that we are not ever in a moment that we have never been in before and thinking about ancestry can also be looking back 50 years um, right now um, and thinking about how brown, black, and queer, and trans uh, folks and their allies made it through um, you know, the worst times. Um, and then the last, the last part of, of that work, General Dynamics, um, that I'll mention was that I, I, in my research, I really started to think about the co-option of, um, of brown and black uh, culture and queer culture, and as I was doing my research and and uh, learning about the the Reagan administration policies and Nixon administration policies and the kind of Hollywoodification of disco, I started to see the whitewashing of that kind of music and how it became presentable to the mainstream and pop culture through um, through white Hollywood figures and movies and you know um, John Travolta and so on and so forth. So there was this other erasure. Um, and I think about that a lot. My own, um, you know, understanding my own um, cultural lineages 
um, through and past erasure and then also um, thinking about the erasure of even recent histories and recent, um, recent forms of uh, resilience and sort of lifting it up. So I think that's it. Thank you. Well, Jan and I are just going to ask each, we're going to ask two questions and then we're going to open it up to the audience because we really want to leave time for all of you uh, to ask some questions. Um, we want to start with bouncing off the idea of fungibility that you brought up, Q, and co-option, Zave, as you were talking about, um, and erasure. In our afterward, Q cautions against domesticating and normalizing queerness, even as we, can t uh, even as we continue to name it in the social and political spheres. And you wrote, queer is being normalized and queer normativized fast as if now norms could outpace themselves. So our book brings together Asian American artists and scholars who are LGBTQ identified, but as well as artists and scholars who are straight identified feminists and allies to both queer and question Asian American art. So I'm wondering if um, any of you on the panel would like to talk about how your relationship in your work, fraught or otherwise, to the categories of both queer and Asian American, and maybe what it meant to be part of this uh, queer collective project. Hmm. What does queer mean to you? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> or, or Asian American, too. Or Asian Both American. of these categories. Later, <laughs> 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 Perry. <laughs> Thank you for preparing my microphone. Um, I'll, I'll say that um, you know those terms for me are are markers. It's like when you're feeling out in the dark and you feel an object, and then you go towards it and you don't quite know what it is or how it applies to you um, or what context you're in. But it's sort of a beginning point to understanding. It's like a placing myself a little bit, even though I know that that it's, you know, in general, I feel like terms are, are very limiting and that our struggle within and outside of those terms happen because uh, we all have anxiety about not being um, able to fully qualify ourselves or, you know, use markers that make sense. I feel like also when you start to chain link um, identity categories, there's also a dissatisfaction in that, or at least I feel that way, that adding more specificity actually loses, for me, cultural tangibility. But mm. queer, I think, you know, approximates um, a lot of things. And then I think Asian American has been hard for me particularly to grasp onto. And so I'm trying to come into relationship with that because mm. I haven't had a model um, of what it means to be Asian um, apart from intimate relationship to my grandmother, for example, who is no longer here. Um, and yeah, I feel like both of those terms, um, like, you know, uh, there's a possibility of intimacy there, but I feel like cultural intimacy is so hard to grasp with, you know, with, uh, with marker terms, identity marker terms. Something that um, I really, and responding to um, with Culey's uh, kind of description of fragility, fluidity, fungibility uh, as ways of actually, uh, you know, thinking about queerness, but also as ways of um, thinking about the tripartite structure of the project that mm. I worked on, actually. Um, mm. It was pretty interesting how uh, much that resonated as I was listening to you describe those, those kind of mm. phases. Mm. Um, uh, because I think that, you know, in some ways the, um, I, was, I was thinking a lot about anthropology when I was making No Place and that kind of fragility strangeness was what I was pushing up against. And then with the empathics, there are people who self-select into um, becoming something else. Um, and they do it with incredibly <laughs> earnest and honest um, desires. Like mm. they, they do it because they're, they really, really believe in something, and they mutate. They actually collectively mutate to become something else, right? So there's this kind of fluidity. Um, and then fungibility, that kind of co-optation of that logic. I mean, it was amazing when you were describing this. Um, 
kind of tri tripartite queerness um, that was exactly the point, right? Mm -hmm. Is like what happens when anything is hybrid? Anyone can download an identity. Anyone can just become anything, wiping away history, wiping away um, what what actually, at least like in my experience, uh, makes me human. Um, so, you know, I, I kind of falsely in some ways um, talk about the project as a project about futuricity. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's, that was an interesting thing too for me listening to you speak. Um, because in some ways it actually is about tracking the multiple modes that we've kind of gone through in this attempt to queer um, or attempt to understand queering. Um, and so, you know, I'm really glad that Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, because that was a really um, insightful uh, series of distinctions for thinking through the work. I, I would also like, I was thinking a lot about what Zave was saying about um, the way that markers operate, and I thought a lot about like uh, Du Bois' double consciousness and this idea of like this marker as something that's being applied to me because this is how I appear and it's something I can't hide. So Asian Americanness, or just Asianness, because not everybody's going to know that I'm also American, um, but also from from the Asian perspective. I mean, most Asians will know I'm very American by my presentation or my behavior. Um, so to be kind of outside and like to see myself in the way that you were saying from the inside and out. But I don't even. So where do those borders lie? Where where at what points am I inside experiencing Asianness, and at what points am I looking at it from the outside? Um, and and, and the sort of like that's where I think a lot about like how real, realizing that I'm essentializing identity just to be able to identify what elements are mine and not, and what elements are are th that that you know what is natural about that, mm -hmm. and and where do we have any agency in how we present our identities as a result of these markers and how they're being defined. Mm -hmm. I'd like to think about this. Uh, the ethics and politics and aesthetics of failure that um, uh, Laura and Jen were talking about as a way to open up right this um, re uh, envisioning <laughs> of this space and 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 uh, the yeah I the it's really the kind of sense of um, um, exhaustion that we all feel, right? The maybe maybe I'm exhausted. Some of you are younger than I am. <laughs> <laughs> I may not feel, but there's sort of categorical exhaustion, mm. right? Yeah. Uh, in Enlightenment period began with a categorical imperative, right? Mm. Mm. We can do it, do it, right? <laughs> there's sort of uh, the that Germanic, right? <laughs> this vigor and rigor, right? I mean, I mean, if you, I guess I'm thinking about this sort of the trajectory of this sort of also kind of modernity and postmodernity, why right? that that really uh, lies at the heart of the theorizing itself, and where does queer actually fit in, or does not fit, right? And so this kind of not so much logos, what it is, right? I mean, approach from very conceptual, like a linguistic kind of, you know, logical point of view as, you know, philosophical, but like a mythological, affective, and, and, and ethical, right, mm -hmm. and performative aspect. So it can be revisited. And so what is in that categorical imperative, right, this compulsion and, and, and the need to define or uh, remain indefinite mm -hmm. huh? mm -hmm. and disidentify huh? as well as identify, right? All these sort mm -hmm. of kind of imperatives, we, I think we're experiencing in a very a uh, lived way, and I almost heard like livid, <laughs> lived experience, like a lived experience, right? So, so we are, on, on, so we are kind of constantly experiencing this kind of you know limit and margins, and you know clash clashes of all the categories, right? On a planetary scale, ecological disaster, and you know, a world is always already about to collapse, and it's miraculous that somehow things go on, right? I mean, I think queerness also has to be located within that kind of, you know, the, the, what we call real life. And so, <clears throat> so that's why I'm interested in the whole kind of this um, uh, sense, not just notion of failure, right? But it, what is it, uh, I mean, so of course, like uh, someone like, uh, um, what's the playwright, Irish playwright, the failure? Um, uh, anyways, forget. <laughs> uh, so, okay, let me give you an example. Uh, 
So I was uh, listening to uh, Dennis Cooper's uh, beautiful reading of, of his very first work called, uh, he was reading this in, 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 at a conference uh, in San Francisco uh, called the My Mark. His mark is the name of, 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 of the, the, the first lover or the one of the lovers that, that he had as a, a young boy. And then it was kind of, so he was inspired by this and he wrote this book in a beautiful you know, novel, Dennis uh, uh, Cooper. And uh, one of the lines that really uh, I found so interesting was this. He said, uh, I mean, in his lines is, okay, this, is, this might be a little graphic for some of you, but please, this is, I'm citing this. His, the, the line goes, my cock isn't hard, but it once was, <laughs> right? And so this is a kind of the, the queer melancholia, right? <laughs> As he's writing it, my cock isn't hard, but it once was, right? So uh, I, I, I don't have that thing with me, so I don't know what is the thing, but, but this, I found that sentence very arousing, right? <laughs> this notion of like, you know, the kind of the temporal marking, right? So it isn't hard, but it once was, right? So you have the kind of space of sort of holding on to some kind of the moment of this kind of, you know, the excitement and, 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 and the kind of uh, 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 the optimism. And immediately, right, you have a kind of instant nostalgia, right, mm -hmm. of loss, right? <laughs> this distance and loss is really, I think, what comes in, in the queer kind of imaginary, right? Mm -hmm. And so just one line just does it. You know, in a sense, right? I mean, it, 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 some, it somehow uh, summarizes, it, if you like, you know, what it is like to inhabit that space of queer temporality and spatiality mm -hmm. in a historical sense too, right? As now, uh, you know, like uh, really, I mean, looking back and reading the very first uh, novel that he wrote like uh, 30, 40 years ago, right? What is it like? Yeah? So, so the whole question of archival return and, and revitalizing it, uh, where does the energy come from in terms of rethinking and re-engaging the question of identity and disidentity? I don't have any ready answer to that, but I just want to uh, contribute that thought and to, to this, uh, um, the, uh, the, 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 to this uh, plate, right, <laughs> that we are engaging. And then just more specifically, I was very interested in, you know, Grayson, your, 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 your constant revisiting and pointing to the question of the middle, middle point, right? And I think it's also uh, what's happening is very this kind of you know uh, 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 in invocation of the question of marking and mucking, right? You, you mark and muck, right? And also mocking, right? This is a kind of you know there's something about something that happens in between, right? The transient moment that actually repeats itself in that dynamic of the distance and loss and, and excitement and disappointment, right? This is a very much I think the kind of you know the the the, the world of, of queerness. Right? that we will inhabit in a very specifically APA context. Also because of the crossing question is very, if you say, if you like sort of trans-oceanic, right? The sort of like oceanic feeling, <laughs> like you're actually like you're going through all different phases in a very, very kind of, you know, continental, trans-continental way, right? Um, and so I, I think there's something very literal about that particular uh, sort of marking that we are inhabiting. So that's what I'll say. Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, Laura and I were talking about this earlier today about um, how, how um, these categories of uh, sexuality and gender have, have really sort of changed and evolved since we were, you know, in, in college. That was, we, I, would, I don't want to wow. sort of mark ourselves, but like, I'm a Gen X, so you can look that up. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, there is sort of this constant sort of evolution of, of categories, and it's never ending, right? I mean, it is sort of like this, this beginning and ending, beginning and ending. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, it, it's, it's quite fascinating to me um, to, to hear young people sort of like, I, I, you know, identify as, as queer or gender nonconforming. And recently, um, I was listening to a podcast um, as I usually do, called, um, this one in particular was really interesting, it was called Pod Save the People, by, um, hosted by uh, activist Ray McKesson. I don't know if you guys um, are familiar with it, but like, um, he had Glad, um, Glad's executive director on, um, that he was, who he was interviewing, her, uh, her name is Sarah Kate Ellis, 
And she gave this astounding and amazing statistic that 40% of millennials and Gen Z uh, folks identify as gender nonconforming. And I just sat there and I was like, really? That is, that's just, that's, that's, that's high, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and then I, and I tweeted at her and I said, are you sure? <laughs> that, that seems really high, but also kind of amazing as well that, um, that young folks are, are really, um, kind of blurring gender distinctions and, 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 and really sort of reconfiguring ways um, of, of thinking about gender and, and, sexual, and sexuality. And she came back, she tweeted back at me, and she was like, yes, actually, it is true. Um, we did a study, CLED did a study, um, a survey, and as well, another uh, or organization did a, a, a similar study and, and found that 40% of young folks uh, Gen Z, I don't know, um, people born in the aughts, the 2000s, um, and, and millennials, I don't even know when that, that time period is, <laughs> but certainly younger than, than me. Um, but I, you know, I think that, that's a really sort of uh, interesting um, statistic, and I, I guess we're, what I'm getting at is, do you think that um, that affects the ways in which Asian American artists sort of, um, uh, you know, is, is it changing the landscape of Asian American art, right? Do you see that as, as being, you know, this sort of like ever sort of changing and evolving way of thinking about gender and sexuality? Um, is it reflected mm -hmm. within sort of the Asian American art? scene, do you think? Do you see that happening now? Do you guys believe the statistic? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I think, it's, I think it's not just a, maybe also we hem ourselves in a little bit in thinking about what that could mean for other people, right? That I feel like it's not just a, it's not just a comment on changing attitudes around uh, our understanding of our bodies mm -hmm. as gendered, but it's also, I think, maybe a, a nice affirmation towards letting go of gendered, uh, stereotypical gendered expectations. Mm -hmm. You know, like I think that it's not just, yeah, I think it, it signals something bigger about um, it's just societal shifts mm -hmm. in how we see our ability to do what we're gonna do in different ways. So I think, I'm sure generationally, there's not as much of an expectation to be um, hetero, get married, have children. All of those things I think are not, um, you know, are part and parcel of the possi of this, these boundaries kind of getting a little bit more, um, you know, dissipating a little mm -hmm. bit. And, mm -hmm. and I feel like it's an opening up. So maybe my definition from my particular standpoint and what it's looked like for me and my trans elders to be trans mm. is different from someone who's 15 years younger than me and that just means that everything's opening up and it feels exciting at least. Yeah. I've heard that statistic yeah. a long time ago and that feels really exciting for me because it also, I hope, although this is a little idealistic, I'm wondering about other ways in which we can let go of our, you know, tight, anxious grip on identity, mm -hmm. um, you know, identity politics in a way. Um, it makes it confusing, but I feel like as, you know, personally as someone who relates to breaking those, <laughs> like break, breaking those boundaries and living in the gray area and not having a, you know, a clear answer. Um, when people ask where I'm from or what I am or whatever, um, how I date or whatever that is, right? Um, I don't know. I feel like there's some, I love the idea that, that, um, that we could be moving in a direction that is mm. not as easily categorizable, but I also think, you know, I'm not, like it's, it's not, I'm not making a dangerous suggestion that we also don't look at, you know, biases, racism, transphobia, homophobia, because that always will exist, even as, especially as we loosen up, it's gonna come back mm -hmm. to reinforce itself, mm -hmm. to try to categorize us into whether or not we deserve or do not deserve 
um, you know, uh, welfare, civil liberties, social systems, whether we deserve our taxes back, right? Um, so even as we open up our categories, I think the systems that we live inside of continue to remind us that we're not at the driver's seat around our identity and that when you get to the ballot box, what you are, whether you've been incarcerated, things like that actually determine what you have right. rights to. Right. Mm -hmm. I want to believe that number, but I feel very wary of it, especially in the context of legibility and how this like queerness is being co-opted as a commodifiable mm -hmm. aesthetic. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, I, I'm just sort of observing. I teach both high school and intro classes and mainly like very small communities, like community college included. And um, I, I don't see any evidence of that. Um, and when I do, I see it in a very uninformed way that's playing with, again, like it's not any different from, you know, trying on pink, boys trying on pink for a day. I, right. I think those markers are not clear. It just becomes something to rebel mm -hmm. and it means nothing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think about, um, you know, this example of like the, the kids who put Nazi sign symbols up in that park in mm -hmm. in what, what park was it? In no, no no in in New York City and you're like the la you know it's the last place but the, it, it became and they did it wrong you know they even put made the not they didn't write the swastikas properly so it just became they knew it was a hate symbol they just didn't even know they had no they have no context to what that even means they just know it's a bad word basically mm -hmm. like a symbol so I, I wonder how much of that forty percent is like seeing gender nonconforming as this like potentially you know, um, transgressive thing that's really exciting for them, mm -hmm. whether or not they actually personally experience it. Mm -hmm. I don't even know what that means, but I find that also to be slightly dangerous in that how our, um, our, our sort of like homophobia, transphobia, how is our phobia of these things being sublimated mm -hmm. by the mm -hmm. rising of this? And how does that become more insidious in a way? Mm -hmm. And that's my fear, is that how is the man box becoming even tighter mm -hmm. than it was before? Because we refuse to look at those lines now because mm -hmm. you're saying you're gender non-conforming. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, Jessica Crispin just published a book called Why I'm Not a Feminist, a feminist Yeah, right, right, right. Which I'm sure <laughs> critiques uh, the commodification of feminism and, and this idea that like maybe people who think they're gender non-conforming, it's, it's because it's a woman who's a CEO of a Fortune 500 company. So if a woman is just aspiring to be what a man has been right, right. until today, like, well, what does that mean? Is that, yeah. is that gender non-conforming? And, and do we, should we aspire to that? So right. I, I totally agree. I am suspect of this, mm -hmm. this 40, 41 percent. It's, it, yeah. Um, really, the, um, the, I mean, I think there's a crisis of, uh, again, maybe I'm speaking, you know, as a kind of a classroom teacher or, you know, uh, uh, but there's a kind of crisis in literacy, cultural literacy, um, or, or clashes of different modes of reading, right, where, um, say, the, I mean, we talk about you know, gender non-conforming and, and as, as a paradigm that we can, oh, this is me, I'm gender non-conforming, but I think it's, it's not counterbalanced uh, by, say, gender, say, reforming, <laughs> let's say, right? <laughs> Effort. So what is your gender fault? Gender if you, if you, yeah. So, yeah, there's a certain kind of, just no, 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 say no, yes, yes, that kind of the, the, the velocity and speed and, and certain carelessness with which we kind of, you know, attach ourselves to those floating signifiers, right? There's a kind of very little space for reading, reading the connotations of or genealogy of concept, right? So, uh, and so uh, the kind of the, the denotation, right? The sort of surface level mm -hmm. words about the database and all of these sort of words that you can just pick and just yeah. choose and, and grab and go, right? This is a very much, you know, the sort of the, the, the mode, right? Modus operandus of, of our, our, our 
kind of textual and also sexual life too, right? In a sense, right? And so that, so I think the depth is really kind of disappearing. Uh, and I think there's got to be some way to capture that 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 depth, right? And I think mm. the mm. science work is, for instance, beautifully doing that. That that kind of the depth of the the mythological archaeological history, you know, is is, is played out on the, in the magic of the surface, right? Mm. But I think we are seduced very quickly mm. by by this. Uh, the surface. That's why I think there's, yeah, so, yes, the, yeah, so yeah. the reforming, like, you know, I mean, it's, it's sort of not happening. And so, uh, I mean, I think there's a direction is really kind of amazing, and it's, we're living in a revolutionary time, in, in gender revolution. You know, I think the, the deconstruction and the sort of deterritorialization did a lot huh, to, 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 to really dismantle the basis for that. But I think perhaps we are focusing too much on the was. <laughs> surfacing, oh, right? Nice. Right. Yeah. Rather than really going deeper into the yeah. archive. That's why I think why we're talking mm -hmm. about this need to really reconnect with the past. The recent past that becomes a messenger, mm -hmm. but we are not reading the messenger properly, mm -hmm. in my view. Anyway, so that I just want to mm -hmm. add that as a, a, a contribution to this conversation. Mm -hmm. There's a question over here. Um, Salve? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you you touched a little bit on um, kind of the performativity of having to reclaim your culture, like being both inside and outside of it at the same time. And I think especially as university students, that's very potent and very prominent within our, where we are at in our lives. So could you speak a little bit more on that? Sure, being, uh, you know, white and non-white, being American, but born in Canada, but living mostly in New York, um, being Indonesian but not having, not speaking the language, um, only understanding bits and pieces of that history, culture, and even my own family's history dynamics and relationships because it's not translated. It's not, you know, I can't, um, I don't have full cultural readership of my own ancest ancestors. Uh, everything, literature, um, uh, uh, mannerisms. Um, so when, when I was starting to make perform performances, experimental films, things like that, I would think about you know, things that I did know, but I realized that in order to actually make work from, from Indonesian culture or theater or whatever it is, mythology, I had to go and read about it and I had to read texts in English, and I, had to, I have to read translations. And I've been thinking a lot recently about um, leaving the US for some time and actually just going to do you know, dance training in a very different way. I'm think, I do a lot of somatic work. Um, and uh, what would it be like, for example, to spend three months with, there's a, there's a Javanese um, meditative uh, uh, dance uh, uh, dancer, choreographer, and um, I've been reading about his work a little bit, and he has these, he, he has like month-long um, practices where people from all over the world come and study with him, and he, he does trainings where people like, you know, stay with him over the years, they, they work with him over the years. Um, what would it be like to be, you know, at the top of a temple for three months, learning meditative movement, and being immersed in an uh, environment that I do have very tender memories of from the times that I visited or from thinking the association that I have with that and my grandmother. Um, but you know, that immersive kind of research is, is really, it's really hard to, to access that here and especially living in New York, being from New York, you know, it brings up a lot of questions. There are a lot of limitations on how much time my, my Western life actually affords me to be able to connect to um, a culture that, I, that I'm from, that I'm made out of, that doesn't have the same values around productivity, time, you know, there are, I, and, I, and I've been thinking about that in some recent work where I've been making this piece called Rubber Time, which is um, based on a phrase, an Indonesian phrase of uh, you know, it's an Indonesian kind of time. It stretches. Sometimes people <laughs> arrive three hours late, right? Yeah. Um, and thinking about that paradigm, thinking about somatic work, stretching out time, um, actually breaking from capitalist notions of productivity and 
uh, life purpose and all of these values that cage us in. Um, I mean, it's, you know, it's like I, yeah, and, and, and the, the phrases that have been coming up as I've been doing that work is, is it possible to decolonize my body? Is it possible to desocialize my body mm -hmm. at all? Is that possible? And then it's an investigation of that. But um, I am the product of the trappings of colonialism, um, assimilation, and uh, Western capitalism. And so investigating even tracings of where I'm from becomes really complicated. And I think rather than saying, you know, um, I don't know, I, I, I like to keep it muddled like that so that I also have a really clear relationship to myself and my work and my ancestry, that it's not a project of saying like, well, I'm Indonesian and you should know that. And it's like, mm, that it doesn't work that way. Um, but also not necessarily alienating myself too, because when I was younger, I, I really was like, oh my God, I'm like an anthropologist in my own work. And this is really uncomfortable and makes me really sad. Um, and I'm not an anthropologist in my own work. It's my flesh and blood. So I can claim that, but it also doesn't have to be something that I wear in a facetious way. I think you just keep it muddled so that you understand your own relationship to power um, as you explore as you explore those things, and so you don't over um, generalize. And you know, we're we're all complicit, and that's important. Oh yes, um, I I'm remembering the name of his practice, which is called Amerta, A M E R T A, and his name. I'll I'll look it up, and I'll send you a I'll send you some information about him. Yeah. Well, I was getting a Western marker of time that we don't have proper time, <laughs> but uh, we are going to be right outside for a book signing, and you can meet uh, the authors and artists. And I want to thank everyone for coming tonight and for us, um, hosting this. Thank you. Thank you.